Okay, we go, away we go. So um, you've made it this far, You're half an hour to go, maybe faster if there's no questions. So um, I, I, I didn't use the title that Ken gave me. I, I, I put between seasons, and the reason I did that is this is a really tough time of year to do an extension talk, and I think you saw that with a number of the talks. We're done our field work, but we're not done crunching numbers. So. I've, I looked through the numbers and I have some ideas based on that, but um, things are not finalized yet. So there'll be some surmising and uh, some guesswork, but um, we'll give you the best picture that I can. Um, what I am gonna do is, um, this one, okay. We're good? Okay, we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about, we do seven major insect surveys. I am going to spend some time on, on most of those. Um, we, uh, we also look at some stuff of, of special concern, and I'm going to spend some time on, on the new midge in, in uh, canola, uh, uh, insect that uh, we've been following a bit. Um, and um, uh, spoiler alert, if you want to leave now, the new midge in canola really isn't an issue in southern Alberta. So, But I'll show you a map to sort of back that up. Um, what you can expect is the maps for wheat midge and wheat stem sawfly will, will, will go live in, uh, in early December. Um, we do that so that if you wanted to be buying varieties based on what, what the surveys show, um, that you'll have some time to do that before, your, before the uh, year end. Um, the balance, usually we, we release right before agronomy update. And, uh, some of those maps are coming back, but I have to, we usually typically have to send them back and forth a few times to make sure that we have things uh, we haven't we've taken the glitches out. So things are coming. Um, so the maps you're not going to see today. Just so if you if that disappoints me, do, you can you can escape now, and I won't blame you. Okay. Um, I also, before I get really into this, um, Alberta is a really big place. Any of you, like Hugh was just talking about surveying uh, both sides of the province, we do the same thing. Uh, we do the same thing with seven different insect surveys, um, but we don't do it alone. Um, the Applied Research Associations are a major partner in this, and Ken's crew is, is a really good support, as well as, as all of the Applied Research Associations. So um, also, I'd be remiss to say uh, not say thanks to the, the agriculture fieldmen from each of the counties. So um, agriculture fieldmen are really good partners and do, do a lot of work uh, on our behalf. So, but there's, there's a whole lot of people and we've kind of set up a system so that we can capture data uh, from lots of different places. And the only name you'll see on there is Shelley Barkley. Shelley's my technician. And any of you that worked with her, you know that Shelley actually is the one that does the work, right? And I get to do the talking. So Shelley's, Shelley's my technician. So um, I really wouldn't have much to say about insect issues this year. Uh, we were idling along and everybody, I was getting phone calls from agrologists in southern Alberta saying, well, there's no insects this year, is there? We don't have, we're going to get away this year without any big issues. And then uh, late July, we started running into diamondback moth. And diamondback moth really um, was a massive issue for canola growers in southern Alberta. Um, and a little bit of a surprise because we've never ever seen anything like that in, in Alberta. I, I talked to the two previous people in my role and they had never seen anything more than a few, few quarters affected. Um, I see Carrie's here, she's the most recent outbreak prior to this year was down in the foremost country and I think what was sprayed me a few thousand acres down there. Um, so this was unprecedented in, in uh, southern Alberta this year. So diamondback moth, this is the adult. Um, the larvae of course are what do the damage and um, many, of, uh, many of you will know that Shelley Barkley also has taken on her on herself to learn how to be an insect photographer. So these are her images, and it sure makes presentations nice when you have that quality of pictures. Um, we had some cases where the numbers were extreme, and this is, you can count, I think there's seven, or six or seven larvae on that one 
uh, one pod. Um, diamondback moth typically don't do much damage, except for when they're in big numbers and then they strip the outside of the pod off. And then you actually your losses are from, from premature dry down of the seeds and shelling. So um, if you're looking at something like this, the, the pods are gonna get the, the surface stripped and you're gonna see that starting to happen on this, this pod. And then later you're going to get, um, you're gonna get the shattering. So, um, so that's exactly what we're looking at and really crazy extreme numbers this year. This is the a close up of the larvae and it's, it, it has this habit of, of hanging on a string in the canopy. Um, and I, I saw some pictures on Twitter of, of, of uh, swather or combine uh, fan intakes just totally covered with, with the webbing from, uh, from the diamondback too. So um, that's something we hadn't seen before. This is the pupal stage. Um, this insect goes through multiple generations and this year um, more so than ever before. Uh, so uh, when it's in this stage, your insecticides aren't going to work um, and uh, it's gearing up for a new generation. Adults will come out shortly after, after this stage. You can see that the moth is pretty much developed inside of there. Anybody wants these pictures, you can talk to me and get a better quality if you... Okay, so this is what we do for monitoring. We actually monitor the spring flight because this insect is not generally over winter in Alberta. Um, we do this at, uh, this year was six, 37 uh, sentinel sites across the province. And the idea is to catch the migration and the early start of the buildup. Um, and then we map it on roping the web and the map looks like this. Um, and you can see that really nothing really crazy going on. The highest numbers are actually in central Alberta. Um, so we were kind of idling along thinking, yeah, it's not so bad, right? And this, this, is, this, uh, this survey goes from, from mid-May to the end of June. So the numbers of adult catch in our pheromone traps was quite normal, not, not extreme. But um, they built up through the summer and um, we started to get calls when guys were doing their sweeps for, for cabbage seed pod weevil and they'd say, I'm not getting any weevil, but boy, are there ever a lot of diamondbacks. And I kept saying, you know, lots of stuff can happen between now and the end of flowering. Let's not get too panicky about it. But the calls started coming in and, and in retrospect, we should have taken it a little bit more serious. We were talking about the potential, but um, probably not as vigorously as we should have been. So there was areas in Southern Alberta that were, were, were blowing up and, and we weren't quite catching it at that point. Uh, I will say we do not forecast this insect because it does not overwinter here. It depends so much on the every year's flight into, into, um, into Alberta. So what happened? This is, I think, the major drivers was this was an extreme year. It was extremely warm, extremely dry, and both things seemed to factor into uh, favorable conditions for diamondback. You can see that typically we would be in a 40 to 45 day life cycle. I think we were much closer to 21 days from egg to adult um, in 2017. And if you do that for a month and a half, like we had this year, you have two complete cycles. Um, and then we're in, we can see those massive buildups. Um, the other thing is, we're not clear on how this impacts parasitoids. We've always said, Parasitoids are a major driver in the system. Um, the hot, dry weather, if you look at the literature on, on parasitoids, they do not do well when it's hot and dry. Their life cycles are, they're, they're, they're the adult um, um, survival is very low in hot, dry conditions. So probably our parasitism was lower. Um, and the other thing that we have been ignoring in this whole system is fungal activity. So, there is a lot of death 
caused by fungal activity on, on, on diamondback moth larvae. And when it's hot and dry, you're not spraying fungicides for your crop because there's no fungus activity. Well, the same thing's going on with, with this beneficial fungus in this system. And I think we've been overlooking how important that is. If you look at central Alberta, it was wetter up there. They had way more moths come in, way more. We had much higher catches, yet they never had any spraying up in anywhere, anywhere much north of, of uh, Highway 9. So, okay, so I think that's what happened. Um, uh, lessons and questions. I, I put this in because I think we, 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 we've got a nice system on the flight, but we're going to have to pay more attention to when we're sweeping for cabbage seed pod weevil, what are the diamondback moth doing? Are they building up? Are they low? You know, that, that did give us a warning, but we kind of didn't pay attention to it. So it's hard to capture, but it certainly was there this year. Um, natural enemies really do play a big part, but we can't say, oh, well, it's always been controlled by natural enemies, but this year it didn't happen, so. Um, I got a lot of feedback on thresholds, and I, I agree, I think the thresholds were inadequate. Um, we, had, we had very poor crops. So how do you determine whether or not it's worth spraying a 10 bushel canola crop when you've got way over the numbers of diamondback moth? We, have, we had a lot of people using plant per plant count, so they pull a plant out and they bang it on the, on the hood of the truck. And I have a hard time equating that to what a real threshold is, because does that plant represent a square foot? Does that plant represent a tenth of a square foot? It's a huge difference, right? So um, we typically want about 10 plants per square foot or five plants per square foot, but we're not getting that always. And if you've got one plant per square foot and, and three larvae on it, it's much different than if you have 10 plants per square foot and one larvae on each plant. It's a completely different thing. So we have to, we have to get around that somehow. Uh, I'm not happy with the per plant unless you equate it back to the, to the area it represents. And when you have a 10 bushel crop, you have far fewer pods. And the damage is on the pods. That's where we get our losses. So we have to factor that in. So somehow we have to get that in the equation. So um, that's, I think that's a big learning from this year. Uh, I think our thresholds will be lower at poorer crops. It's as simple as that, it has to be because we don't have a dilution effect of, of, the, of the feeding. So um, another big learning, and I had a conversation of this earlier today, is synthetic pyrethroids do not work at high temperatures. So we cannot be so careless in our, in our consideration of how we're using them, I guess. Uh, we had side-by-side -side fields. One was sprayed in later in the day, and one was sprayed at midday, and the midday stuff was not working. So we have to pay attention to it. It says right on the label do not spray above 25 Celsius. So we gotta pay attention to that. Um, uh, immediately we get the, oh, it's not working, we have re insecticide resistance. Well, that wasn't the case. If the neighbors is working, it's the same population. So we have to be paying some attention to that. Um, is my intention, we just are finishing our field work, we just finished our field work last week. Um, we're going to put together a questionnaire to get out to agrologists uh, for feedback on, on what, what the questions are that weren't well answered. Because this, this is a historic year with this insect, so let's learn from it. Let's not let our lessons pass us by. So if you're an agrologist, and I know your contact information, you'll probably get an email saying, Daryl, uh, help us out. Tell us your experience, because we might as well capture our frustrations and learn from them. Okay, so that's the big one for Southern Alberta. Any questions, comments? Yes? I got one that I think you don't want to hear, but I think might sum up where that's from. Okay, absolutely. You didn't see any, um, you didn't see any people. Like I know I and another agronomist were comparing notes, and like about eight, ten years ago, we had another year 
where you know there was some spraying for Kit Diamondback. Yeah. No one sprayed for weevils that year except that yeah. first generation. And I, if you, if everybody didn't hear that, that's a very important point because. Um, if you'll remember, Hector Torquemo stood up at Agronomy Update and talked several times about this, this project we had in fields where we would spray a cabbage seed pod weevil and follow insect populations through the year. And there is not a doubt that if you have to spray dime or cabbage seed pod weevil, um, that there, there is not the same level of diamondback later in the season. Th th that's absolutely right. So, yes, you're right. Absolutely, and I think the two are connected somewhat, but then we, and I didn't put it in here, but you're right. I, I think there's a connection. We had very few acres sprayed for cabbage seed pod weevil this year. And if we had, we'd, we'd seen less field disasters with, with uh, diamondback later. Yes? So if you would just put that into your program and spray it, would you still have to spray for diamondback? If we just put that in our program and sprayed it, I, my answer is, um, if you have to spray for cabbage seed pod weevil, spray, right? Absolutely. But don't spray just because it might help us later. If we have to spray for diamondback later, then we have to spray for diamondback later. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> who the heck knows that we're going we're gonna to end, end up with weeks on end of plus 30? Like, when have we seen that past? That's like... I really am loath to talk about program spraying. It's like canola's in flower, so I'm going to spray it, and then everything is going to be fine. Well, I think, I think we're asking, we just had a talk on insect or herbicide resistance. If we want to start breeding or selecting for insecticide resistance, let's spray everything on a program instead of when we need to, because that's what will happen. We'll lose our insecticides because they'll quit working. So. I'm, if we have to spray, we have to spray. Make a decision based on thresholds and then do the job. But don't spray just because I might not have to spray later. I think it's a, it's a, bad, it's a bad thing in the long term. So is that, that's pretty much straightforward answer. So I know you don't like my answer. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, let's move on. How am I doing for time? Okay. So pea leaf weevil. Um, uh, just a, a couple slides on it. Uh, this slide is to remind us all that it likes faba beans as well or better than, than peas. Um, faba bean acres not a big deal at uh, this part of the world. But other parts of the province are, um, like to grow some faba beans, but they really like faba beans. Yield losses from the larval damage on the nodules. And I'm going to show you some, some maps from previous years. And these are not forecasts, these are just, just uh, numbers. And you'll notice that we get big years and small years. Um, over the years, things go up and down. And one year does not predict the next. There, there's really not much relation from one year to the next. Uh, on populations. So um, this is the most recent map from 2016. 2017 uh, map will be less colorful um, and the range did not increase up in the north but um, a little bit lower, kind of a, a blah in between year on pea leaf weevil. Um, but I think if you're fighting, have been fighting pea leaf weevil for years, you know that seed treatment's the best way to manage it. You, you put your seed treatment on, and then you don't worry so much. Now, um, I didn't point out on one of those slides, if you're farming along this Highway 41 corridor, pea leaf weevil has not been a huge issue for you, except for one or two years. It's been pretty low, so I'm not so sure um, that it's as much uh, seed treat uh, automatically out here. And I know a number of farmers out in this area are, are moving away from seed treatment because they don't see the pressure year after year. So that I, I accept that. Um, last thing on pea leaf weevil, if you're, tr if you're growing alfalfa on your farm, pea leaf weevil can be hell on alfalfa seedlings. And you need to be aware of this. And 
you need to be watching your alfalfa seedlings and you will probably have to spray. So just, it's just a word to the wise, um, just pay attention to it, okay? So any questions on pea leaf weevil? I think it's, it's become a kind of old hat management thing here. Grasshoppers. Um, so these are forecast maps. So you'll see there's a 2017 on there. Um, you will see if we go back in history, that go back into 2012, that Southern Alberta is essentially green, no grasshopper risk at all. We've been slowly edging up on the risk. And you'll notice that we have a kind of a hot spot developing on 2017 forecast in that Lethbridge, Willow Creek, Vulcan sort of triangle of, and guess what, that's where it's been dry. And that was dry again this year. Grasshopper numbers are climbing. Um, they're not climbing uniformly across southern Alberta, but the numbers are up. And um, you can do your own grasshopper forecast. Pretty simple. You just, you had grasshoppers in numbers la uh, jumping around your headlands this fall. That's your forecast, right? If you didn't have many, probably not much risk next year. Because we need grasshoppers to make grasshoppers. So um, it's pretty straightforward in southern Alberta. We're tracking some crazy stuff up in the Peace and uh, north, uh, northwest central Alberta, where we're getting an every other year. So we get outbreaks of grasshoppers in odd number of years in, in that part of the world. And we got, we're working on getting to the bottom of it. But it's safe to say that we've been wrong with the grasshopper forecast in that part of the world for 10 years now. So, so whatever the grasshopper forecast says for the piece, do the opposite. Um, down here, it, it's pretty reliable. Okay, cabbage seed pod weevil, probably a historic low year. Um, we've seen some high years, look at 2016, very high. Uh, 2017 survey is gonna be much, much less probably bordering on, on no red in southern Alberta. So uh, quite low numbers, okay? We work, we work with agrologists on, on this survey and we have a reporting system, a web-based reporting system. We really appreciate it because it helps us check our numbers and also you guys are getting really good at managing this and we have a hard time getting there in the field at the right time because if we sweep a canola field and there's no insects, you've sprayed it. And that's what we find in southern Alberta is often we go to a field and there's nothing there, which means it's been sprayed. So uh, agrologist reporting into this system is really important. Okay, any questions on cabbage seed pod weevil? That's it's pretty straightforward management. It's been for several years now, uh, nothing surprising. Wheat midge, more good news for southern Alberta. Um, the only outbreaks we've had in southern Alberta is Willow Creek a few years ago when they were part of that monsoon country. I remember Willow Creek was pretty much swimming uh, a few years back. They had a wheat midge outbreak. Um, and we've had some issues on irrigated wheat. So if you're growing wheat on wheat on irrigation, you need to be paying attention to this one. Um, our surveys won't always pick up individual fields. So um, we've had uh, substantial losses in Newell County on irrigated wheat in the past. If you're rotating well, um, um, probably not an issue, but uh, just be warned that if you're growing a lot of wheat on your irrigation, you need to pay attention to this. And it may not be reflected in, in the forecasts. So, okay. Wheat stem sawfly. So um, this is what I did my master's degree on. So if you have a couple hours, we can go into some detail here. Um, but um, we are seeing a resurgence. And I'm going to show you a couple slides that, uh, on this. But um, we're a 2017 survey, when I looked at the numbers, is as high as we've seen uh, since, the, since it crashed. So um, we're seeing a resurgence in this insect. and. Um, guess what? Uh, it's happening in Willow Creek, northern Lethbridge, southern Vulcan, where it's been dry for a few years, okay? We're also seeing numbers climb in 40 mile. Yeah, 
we hate to leave 40 mile out because they're always the vortex of insect problems. Um, and the MD of Acadia, we found a high spot as well. So all traditional soft fly areas, all doing really well in dry conditions. I can go into all the theory behind it and what's driving it, but in dry conditions, soft fly increase. So grasshoppers and soft fly lockstep on dry conditions. Okay, that's the bad news. Good news, birth armyworm. Uh, this was the high point in 2013 and 2014. 40 mile had a little bit in 2014. And since then, it's looked like this. So this is uh, pretty nice when we get this kind of results on birth armyworm. It means we're not spraying many acres. There's an odd field that gets sprayed, but for the most part, this is what it's been since 2015. Pretty low. And we have a live reporting map. Uh, last year, it says we had 230 trap locations. Uh, ag, ag fieldmen and applied research associations are a big part of this, as are our agrologists. And many farmers do these for, for the system as well. Um, if you're farming and you want to birth a trap, let me know, because we'll hook you up. One trap in Warner was above, above the initial warning. And um, there's one trap uh, up by Stetler that was close. And there, I think there's two or 300 acres sprayed up by Stetler this year. So I've been expecting a resurgence of this insect. We typically get um, outbreaks every five years. We're right on that cusp of we should be seeing uh, outbreaks coming back. Really low right now. But we always get lulled into this sense of, uh, of uh, safety. And we've really worked this last year to increase our monitoring on birth armor to catch that outbreak. Because somebody's going to get hammered if we don't watch. So um, I always get asked about winter conditions and insects. And for most part, our insects are pretty tolerant of, of, uh, of our winters. Birth armyworm, if it gets cold when it's bare, it kills them. And that's why we don't get many outbreaks in southern Alberta, because we get the Chinooks that bear it off, and then we get a week of minus 30, and everything's done. Well, guess what? We haven't been getting minus 30 for a long time now. So that may change. Um, but I think um, we're going to see more birth armyworm next year. Uh, where is the question? Probably that Stetler might be uh, the center of it. Um, I don't know what the thing at Warner is. Who knows? Every now and then we get an odd one. So, Cereal leaf beetle, actually quite low this year. I, I put it in because we see s people spraying for cereal leaf beetle, and for the most part, we don't need to. Okay? And there's, there's, a, there's a really good... Um, beneficial insect that's keeping this population down. So the less we can spray it, the more the beneficial insect will do its job, the less we'll have to spray it. So, so it's just, just, if you don't need to spray, don't spray, because it'll help us out. Okay, cutworms. Um, we have a, a live tracking system. Um, and uh, this is what it looked like this year. Um, Red back and pale western cutworm, and really no uh, pattern to it, except for southern Alberta last year had virtually no reports, and we had more reports this last, and in, in 2017. Uh, so I would suspect that you need to pay attention to your crop establishment next year, just to be sure that you're not in that one of those cutworm fields. I think that. Um, there's a risk that this, this is a buildup that we're seeing in southern Alberta. So pay attention to it. Okay? Ah, now, this one. Canola flower midge. This is not the official name, so don't write it down, Barb. Don't, don't write it down. This is not the official name. It has not been named. It doesn't have a species name yet. Um, we, we've done surveys for it for the past two years. Um, in 2017, we did a delineation survey where we looked at all of central Alberta, and I'll show you the map in a second. Um, it's a very low incidence. The highest we found was uh, we, look, we look at 100 racemes per field, and the highest we found was 25 flowers affected. So that's the high. And typically, you find one or two flowers affected. 
It only attacks the flowers. And as if you haven't heard this before, I'm shocked, I'll be shocked, but flowers are somewhat expendable in canola. You can lose some flowers, you don't lose a lot of yield, okay? So we're not that concerned at this point. Unless it starts taking out all our flowers, then we'd be much more concerned. But at this point, it's taking out a few flowers is all it's doing. So what does it look like? That's exactly what it looks like in the field. It looks like a flower that just didn't open and couldn't open, okay? And we're, we're calling them bottle flowers. If you look up and down the raceme, um, below it and above it, there'll be uh, uh, pods forming, but yet you have this flower that never opened. It looks kind of orangey, and it's not drought, because uh, droughted ones look like a flower that just never opened. This is one that tried to open, but just couldn't make it, okay? Um, if you touch them, they don't fall off. Droughted flowers fall off when you touch them, okay? So if you open that up, Inside there, you'll find little maggots. And this is a canola flower, so you know what the size of those little maggots are. They're tiny, okay? And they're in there, and they're just, they're just damaging the flower and eating away on the pistil, and guess what? It never opens, never produces a pod. Um, but that will cling on to the plant for quite some time, so they're quite easy to pick up. Okay, so that's how we do the survey. We just go look at how many damaged flowers we're finding. So this is the survey we did it over a period of three days. So we were somewhat busy for three days. Um, we actually had four teams out looking um, and we basically just drove up and down secondary highways. And the blues, are we found no evidence. The reds, we found the larvae. And the yellows, we found um, uh, damaged flowers. And they're very distinct. And we know when we look at them under the microscope that they are absolutely damaged by this midge. So that gives us a pretty good read on where we're finding it pretty much throughout central Alberta. But that Highway 12 from uh, Stetler out towards, what is it, um, not Provost, um, Concert, out that way out to Alterio, that's the, what I'm looking for. It seems to be the southern border. We're not finding it south of that. So. Um, this is not Swede midge, thank you, Ken. This is a new midge, um, and for a long time, you probably heard that there's Swede midge in Saskatchewan. Well, for the most part, they were finding this. And um, some, some indication that maybe they had a pocket of Swede midge, but it seems to have died out, and all they find now is this midge in Saskatchewan. So, um, it's a, Good news, bad news story, I guess. It's the bad news, we have a new insect. The good news is it's not that serious, at least not yet. In Saskatchewan, they found parasitoids that are attacking it. So the, the current thinking is that it probably is a, an insect that's been around for some time, likely native, moved off of something native into canola flowers. And for parasitoids to be found immediately after we find the insect, means that it's, it's, got, it's been around for a while. So, so likely never to become a big problem. We sure, we sure hope not. We've got enough issues, okay? So good news, bad news, I guess. Uh, a couple little last things. Um, if you want to be part of our surveys, we are very welcome of you giving us a call, letting us know that you would welcome us onto our fields. It's much easier to talk to you when you know we're coming than to talk to you over the fence with a, a, a gun in the gun rack. And, um, we, we, we're trying to do more of this. Um, it it's, goes both ways. It's a kind of a respect thing. Uh, we have a hard time, though. We, we, we're in somewhere around 1,500 fields a year, so it's really hard to track guys down ahead of time. We would need three times the manpower to do do, do work ahead. So if you want us to be in your field, uh, pea leaf weevil, cabbage seed pod weevil, wheat midge, and wheat stem sawfly, we'd be welcome, we'd welcome your fields. Um, several, several of you in the, in the room, we do that with already, and you know that you get an email in the spring saying, where are your fields? Which ones do you want us to look at? Um, we ask certain questions like, 
wheat field we like next to last year's wheat, stuff like that. And you just send us back an email and then we magically come out and, and then sometime in December or January you get a report from us saying, we're at your field and we found no wheat midge and we found high levels of sawfly and stuff like that. So you'll get a report back from us. Okay, a couple last things. Um, we work really hard on not keeping secrets, if that makes any sense. Uh, we really want you to know what we know. Uh, if, we, if something's happening, we're doing our best to make sure you know. Um, there, there's uh, our, uh, our website, which Shelley has editorial control over, so if something's happening, she makes sure there's live links to it. Uh, we do Call of the Land, and we do uh, um, uh, very active on Twitter, uh, do Twitter chats for those of you who are so inclined. Um, we really do work at it. I would say though, probably don't phone me in the summer because you're probably not gonna catch me. It's probably best to talk to the guys at the Ag Info Center because they're in the office, I'm not, okay? And that's all I had, so any last questions? Okay, well, I appreciate the chance to come out and talk, Ken. <laughs>